Hello, everyone. So yeah, as Roland said, I'll give an introduction to PyTorch uh, today. Um, probably the thing you all want to know is what is PyTorch? Um, but let me ask you a question first. Like, who is using Python in this room? Just like, um, and who used NumPy? <laughs> and who would like to NumPy to run 30 times faster? <laughs> OK, then PyTorch is something for you. Um, because PyTorch is basically an NDRA library with GPU support. And if you run stuff on the GPU, it goes faster if you can parallelize it, which is most of the time the case with arrays. Um, but instead of going through like what PyTorch can actually do and how awesome it is, uh, let me just show you code that's always better. So similar to NumPy, you always have to import Torch. It's like, oh, OK, that was boring. Nothing happened. Um, you can build tensors with um, PyTorch just by saying, I want to have a tensor uh, size 5 by 3. Can you read it in the back row? Otherwise, I will make it. OK, awesome. Um, the really cool thing about PyTorch is that you can actually print the tensor and you get values on the console. Because if you use TensorFlow or Keras, it will tell you, like, oh, yeah, this is a tensor somewhere in the graph. Uh, but you never really see the values which are in this tensor, which is super annoying for debugging because that's like the most awesome debugging tool to print. Um, you can see there are like really weird values in there, everything from 10 to the power of minus 41 to 10 to the power of 21, uh, or even higher. Um, this is simply because if you just say, I want to have a tensor, it just tells you like, okay, here's your data, and it's just whatever was in the memory before. Um, so normally you want to go with something like this. You, for example, want to randomly initialize the um, array, which gives you an array which is basically containing values between 0 and 1 randomly. Um, you can as well always ask PyTorch, okay, what is the size of the tensor? It will tell you 5 by 3. You can again print the values. Um, but of course, you normally, especially in deep learning, you don't really want to see the whole tensor because it's simply huge. Um, the cool thing with PyTorch is you can as well slice like you're used to do in NumPy. So you can just say, okay, I want to have um, basically, in this case, the first column and uh, the second column, and it gives you the second column. So since it's so similar to NumPy, there's, of course, a bridge to NumPy because that's what everyone uses in Python nowadays when they have arrays. Like the first thing they do is, okay, I read it into NumPy array, and then I figure out what I do. Um, the really cool thing is, so we built this TensorX, and we want to have the NumPy version. We just say, OK, dot NumPy, and we print it, and it prints a NumPy array. But the really cool thing is, it does that without any overhead. So um, NumPy and PyTorch are pointing to the exact same data. So it's basically just telling, like, OK, one uh, outputs you the PyTorch version of it, the other the NumPy. But if I, for example, now add one to the PyTorch tensor, it adds it as well to the NumPy tensor simply we have, because we have the same reference. And that simply makes the conversion between NumPy and PyTorch super fast because it basically just tells you, like, okay, now interpret it as PyTorch data and don't copy it at all. Um, the same thing holds for the other way. So if you have NumPy data, like in this case an array of ones, you can just call torch.fromNumPy, and it makes a torch tensor out of it. And again, if you add something to the NumPy data, it will be added to the PyTorch data. So that's really nice to replace NumPy, but that's not why most of you are here on the conference. So NumPy offers other, uh, PyTorch offers other things as well. Um, it has an automatic di uh, differentiation engine meaning that it can, every variable knows how it was calculated and can calculate the gradients with respect to every variable in the system, which simply allows you to do deep learning on this, um, with this framework um, or reinforcement learning. Um, on top of that, you have some gradient-based optimization packages like uh, simply gradient descent optimizer or atom optimizer or you name it. OK, you not name it because it's one year old, so they are still implementing some of them. But they already have six or the six or seven most common ones implemented. 
and you have utilities. So they have utilities to load data. They provide um, by default some standard data sets with their API. So of course MNIST, um, but as well CIFAR 10 and some other ones. So the way this is working, and now it's getting a bit uglier, um, is basically from the Autograd package from, uh, from Torch, you import a variable. The variable is wrapping the tensor so it can remember how it was calculated and how the gradients flow through the system. Um, the functional, you'll see it later, is just a convenient library where you can find functionals. So that you just have to import. Um, and then, for example, let's build um, the four different variables, like in this case, x, previous age, um, to weights. Um, and then we calculate um, I to H and H to H, we sum them up and we put an activation function on it. So basically building a really simple neuron. Um, so in this case, it calculates now next age. So you can actually already see what is in next age if you have given X and Y, which is different compared to TensorFlow because there you build a graph, then you put data in and when you run it, you actually get the result with PyTorch. It's you get the result immediately, but now if you want to have the gradients with respect to every variable, you just call dot .backward um, with a given variable. So in this case, I just put once in there to show how it works. Um, and then, I'll just add a cell. You can just, for every variable, uh, print the gradients given this output for this input. So if you have as well some problem where you have an input and you know the output and you want to calculate the error gradients, you can just print them easily to the console compared to TensorFlow where you would again need to build an output node to then catch the data, to then export them to the CPU, to then print them, which is a bit cumbersome if you have to debug it. Um, so Let's see how this actually works on neural networks. So um, with Torch, you can install Torch Vision, which is simply this utility package. Um, in this case, we will use MNIST because everyone uses MNIST because it's good to um, show some cases. So I hope it's still downloaded. Um, so what it does is it's uh, downloading the data in the background and just provides you with the training, the test set, and related loaders to actually train your neural network. So for example, in this case, I just go and have a look at the um, training data and at the training label. So you can see it's a five and it kind of looks like a five as well. Sorry for the heat plot. I just do heat plots all the time. They look fancier than grayscale. Um, so we, of course, now want to build a neural network which can actually figure out how MNIST works. Um, the way this is done in PyTorch is that every neural network inherits the nn.module class, um, which simply does most of the parameter handling in the background, and you have it all encapsulated like you're used to in object-oriented programming. It's like everything you need for the neural network is part of this uh, neural network class, um, which is quite handy compared to TensorFlow or Keras where you have to figure or you have to find the parameters if you actually want to change them. You have to find the variables in the GPU memory and here you just go through the parameters uh, of this object and you have basically everything which is related to the neural network in there. So in this case, I just use a really simple model, uh, module, uh, model, neural network. Um, with two convolutions and three linear layers and a bit of dropout in between. Um, I choose a criterion for optimization. In this case, with classification, uh, simply cross-entropy uh, and an optimizer. So I just choose the atom optimizer because I like it the most. It's like, it's a bit of dark magic and everyone likes to take his own optimizer. Um, you will get a preference throughout your working with deep learning. Um, oh, and I have to hurry. <laughs> you then do uh, a forward pass, which is basically then replacing calling the object. So every time you call net and put an input there, it will call the forward function. 
um, and to train the neural network, you zero the optimizer that you just have to do because it buffers gradients. You calculate the output, you calculate the loss, you do backward propagation with the loss, and then you step the optimizer. Um, and that's how you call it. It's basically you build the model, you build an input variable. In this case, I just start with random stuff. And this is how you calculate the output. You just call the object. Um, cool thing is, if you want to do it on your GPU, you just call once.cuda. It puts all the data into the GPU, um, does the calculation. And if you then need to get the data back, you call .cpu. It puts it back into the CPU. And you can just print it to the console. And it's all really nicely embedded into Python. So I could like go way more into this, but I was told I have to stop. <laughs> it's tricky doing 10 minutes with PyTorch. <laughs> but I hope you all took something from it and you at least saw how it integrates. <laughs>